June 6, 2020 will be the 76th anniversary of the Allied invasion of Normandy, which began the historic World War II battle to liberate continental Europe from Nazi control. Aging veterans were interviewed. There were contrasting accounts of the invasion. The first interview was with a soldier who had landed on Omaha Beach. He recalled horrors that sounded like scenes from Steven Spielberg's Academy Award-winning movie, Saving Private Ryan. The aging veteran recalled looking around at the bloody casualties surrounding him and concluding, we're going to lose. The next interview was with a U.S. Army Air Corps reconnaissance pilot who had flown over the whole battle area. He viewed the carnage on the beaches and on the hills, but he also witnessed the successes of the infantry, the penetration by the paratroopers, and the effectiveness of the aerial bombardment. He looked at everything that was happening and concluded, we're going to win. Their point of view determined their opinion of what was going to happen. How, did, how do you view your life? From what point of view do you see your life? The way you see yourself is the way you see the world. During this coronavirus, I had a meltdown. It was after I was told that we couldn't have drive-in church by our, our health department. I had done all I could do, thought I had a reasonable and safe option, and I cried out to God and chose to have a change of perspective. We will see in the book of Philippians that perspective is everything. In the first chapter of Philippians, Paul is under arrest, chained to a burly Roman soldier, awaiting trial on a capital offense. Yet we find Paul rejoicing. How is joy possible in the midst of problems and adversity? The answer, four words, his point of view. When we have God's point of view on our problems, we can have joy even in the most difficult trials. Now, who's the who of Philippians 1, verses 1 and 2? Paul and Timothy are the who, servants of Christ Jesus, to whom was the book of Philippians written? To all the saints in Christ who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The how, how do we gain God's point of view? By receiving joy in prayer, verses 3 through 11 of chapter 1. Paul prays a prayer of thanks for their partnership, and it produces joy in Paul's heart. And here's verse 3 through 8. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God will never give up on you. Paul believed that the Philippians, through God's help, that their perspective would change. Why? He says in verse 7, It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul says, because I hold you in my heart, because I love you, I am joyful in prayer for you. This is a love letter from Paul to the Philippians. Who are you thankful for? What brings joy to your life? This prayer continues. Paul prays for their spiritual growth, verses 9 through 11. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Paul believed that the Philippians could grow spiritually through a growing love for God and for one another, and gaining more knowledge and discernment from the Word of God, and through the Holy Spirit, 
and it would produce a loving, godly, holy lifestyle. I believe the same is true today. As, God, as God's love flows through you, and it grows in you, and you grow in the knowledge of the Word of God and discernment from the Spirit of God, your life will be transformed, and you will live a loving, fruitful, godly life filled with joy. How do we do this? We need to ask God to help us see from His vantage point in our circumstances. In your prayers, thank God that a Christ-centered, eternal perspective brings joy. Do you find joy in prayer like Paul? Are you thankful for your relationships, your partnerships in Christ? Is your love for others growing and abounding? Are you growing spiritually and praying for others to grow spiritually? We see Paul's prayer of joy for the Philippians for their relationship and their spiritual growth, but why is this so important? Because to have joy in adversity, it depends on your perspective. It has been said that a person will experience in about every 10 years at least one obstacle, one event, one downturn. And when that heat, that adversity comes and it can, it can help us to boil things down to what is really important. It helps you to learn to rest in the fact that God is with you in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of adversity. Paul was going to give the Philippians a different perspective. Paul's perspective first was that he believed adversity helped the gospel advance. And we see in verses 12 through 18, he, Paul, Paul, Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Through adversity, the good news in Christ gives hope and draws people to God. Through this virus, people have had time to receive and hear the good news, to think about what really matters. Paul's second perspective? He believed adversity exalts Christ. Look in verses 19 through 26. We will either be beaten or bravened. Paul chose by the grace of God to be brave. He, he goes on to say, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die, to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. In Christ, life or death is a win-win situation. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul chooses to live for others. A cemetery here in Indiana has a tombstone which is more than 100 years old. The epitaph reads, Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so will you be. So prepare for death and follow me. To which someone added, 
to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. Death is life's only certainty, a certainty which most people don't like. Most people feel about death like Woody Allen, who said, it's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. It is so ultimate, it is so final, it is so utterly inescapable. Someone has said, when we look at death, we are like a chicken hen before a cobra. We find ourselves incapable of doing anything at all in the presence of the very thing that seems to call for the most drastic and decisive action. The disquieting thought that stares at us like a face with a freezing grin is that there is, in fact, nothing that we can do. Say what we will, dance how we will, we will soon enough be a heap of ruined feathers and bones, indistinguishable from the rest of the ruins that lie about. It will not appear to matter in the slightest whether we met the enemy with mental calmness, shrieks, or trumped up a trumped up laugh. There we will be. Yes, most people view death with fear. It looms as a huge shadow over all of life. Not so for the Christian. One of the great blessings for us who have accepted Christ as our Savior is that we don't have to fear death. Like Paul, we can say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This confident assurance that God has a place for us in heaven brings great joy. If, if you know Christ as your personal Savior, then you don't have to fear death. You can see it as a homegoing, a graduation, a passage. Death is a door through which we, can, we pass from this life to the next. At the point of physical death, our physical body may die. But in God's mysterious providence, we are with the Lord. Lorraine Botner, in his book Immortality, wrote, I am standing on a sea shore. A ship at my side sp spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the ocean blue. She is an object of beauty and strength, and I stand and watch her until at length she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and sky come down and meet each other. Then someone at my side says, there she is gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight. That is all. She is just as large in mast and hole and spar as she was when she left my side, and just as able to bear her load of living weights to its place of destination. Her diminished size is in me, not in her, and just at the moment when someone says, there she is gone, on that distance you were waiting to take up the glad shout, says, here she comes, and such is dying. When we are ready to die, we are best prepared to live. Paul's third perspective, he believed adversity encourages believers. Paul believed adversity encourages believers to stand firm. Verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul believed adversity encourages believers not to fear, verse 28, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Paul believes adversity encourages believers to accept suffering. Look at verse 29 and 30. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Rav Ravi Zacharias, who passed away this past May 19th, 2020, told the amazing story of a young Christian in Vietnam. He writes, I was ministering in Vietnam in 1971, and one of my interpreters was Hien Pham, an energetic young Christian. He had worked as a translator with the American forces and was of immense help both to them and to missionaries such as myself. Hien and I traveled the length of the country and became very close friends before I returned home. We did not know if our paths would ever cross again. 17 years later, I received a telephone call. Brother Ravi, 
the man asked. Immediately, I recognized Hen's voice, and, and he soon told me this, his story. Shortly after Vietnam fell, Hen was imprisoned on accusations of helping the Americans. His jailers tried to indoctrinate him against democratic ideals and the Christian faith. He was restricted to communist propaganda in French or Vietnamese, and the daily deluge of Marx and Engels began to take its toll. Maybe he thought, I have been lied to. Maybe God does not exist. Maybe the West has deceived me. So Ian determined that when he awakened the next day, he would not pray anymore or think of his faith. The next morning, he was assigned the dreaded chore of cleaning the prison, prison latrines, the outside toilets. And as he cleaned out a tin can overflowing with toilet paper, his eye caught what seemed to be English printed out on one piece of paper. He hurriedly grabbed it, washed it, and, and that night retrieved the paper and read the words. Romans chapter 8. Trembling, he began to read. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. For I am convinced that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He and wept. He knew his Bible and he knew that there was not a more relevant passage for one on the verge of surrender. He cried out to God asking forgiveness for this was to have been the first day that he would not pray. After finding the scripture, he and asked the commander if he could clean the latrines regularly because he discovered that some official was using a Bible as toilet paper. Each day, he had picked up a portion of the scripture and, and at that night, he, he, he washed it and cleaned it and read it with his other scriptures and it was treasured to he and his perspective changed. He realized that God had a purpose and a plan for him, as God does for you. Eventually, he and Pham was released from prison and fled to Thailand. Today, he is a businessman in the United States, a radiant Christian and living a living testimony to the power of God's Word and its transforming power. We have and are going through a difficult time, and we will have adversity in our lives. Your perspective, your point of view, will make all the difference in your life. Whether you will experience joy in prayer, whether you will experience joy in your relationships, in your spiritual growth, and the spiritual growth of others. Will the gospel be advanced? Will other people see Christ in you in your times of adversity? For a practical application this week, we see a lot of surgical masks in public now, more than ever. Do we see them? Personally, I have hated seeing them. I've hated wearing them. I've had to wear one every time I go into one of my favorite stores. I want to challenge you to join me as I change my perspective, my point of view about the mask I see. Every time you see a surgical mask, homemade or manufactured, I would ask you to think of one thing that you have chosen to have joy in through the season of the coronavirus. And each time you see that, I want you to try to think about one thing that God is doing in you. One place where you have chosen to have joy. On several occasions, King Abdullah II of Jordan has disguised himself and mingled with his subjects. His rationale for this unorthodox approach is to better understand and serve his people. Taking the character of an ordinary old Arab man, he would don a beard and a kaffa and the Arabic white robe, and he'd walk around government buildings without security, and was, he was not even noticed. And while waiting in a long line, he engaged people in conversation and listened to their point of view. Such incognito appearances have marked the 58-year-old monarch's reign since he assumed the throne in 1999. He disguised himself as an old man previously while visiting a hospital. Another time he circulated around Amman as a taxi cab driver. He passed himself off as a television reporter trying to cover a story at a duty-free shop. There are two different differing opposing perspectives 
on King Abdullah's disguises to gain understanding and to serve his people. Here's one. A reporter said, I think that being in disguise and going around as a normal civilian to listen to their problems and know more about their needs is a good thing. I think it would make a great movie. The second point of view was one of the Jordanian government employees. They aren't taking any chances. They have started to spend time looking at people's faces, fearing that they could meet the king in disguise. King Abdullah wanted to hear and know a different point of view. It's a matter of your point of view. The way you see yourself is the way you see the world. Jesus also came to earth to experience a different point of view. The Son of God came to earth as a baby, lived a common life, and then gave his life for our sin. He took our point of view so we could have his point of view to someday live with him eternally. What's your point of view, your perspective? The only way to change it is to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. I can think of no better time than now to turn your life over to Jesus. Let's pray together. Eternal God and Father, we are grateful for this time. And Father, we just pray that our perspective would bring joy, that it would be higher because of Christ in our lives. And we just thank you, Lord, and praise you just now as you work to change us, to grow us in relationships and through adversity. And Father, we give all you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.